Uh, welcome back. Uh, we have our first speaker of the local session, uh, Professor Eva Hoffmann. Uh, and uh, she's a professor at the Chromosome Stability. I'm just going to try to find her presentation here. Uh, I think this may be the one. Uh, and it's my really great pleasure to have her here. And Eva, you can just uh, come up here and um, start whenever you're ready. Thank you very much for joining. Let's welcome Eva. Well, thank you very much, Morten and Daniela, for the invitation to participate. It's really a great setting here. And um, I'm going to see if I can get this to work. I'm going to talk a little bit about reproductive aging, um, because this is something that affects women. It's something that comes very early, and it's something where we think they're actually fertile grounds for interventions very early on for relatively young women. So in humans, we have two very, very distinct curves with regards to reproductive aging. The first one is the fertility curve, and this fertility curve, as you can see here, starts at Menarche, and then it goes down um, as women enters their um, kind of 30s, mid-30s, really, is when we call women, or we consider women advanced maternal age. This is obviously something that's really being affected by women delaying childbirth now, particularly the first child. So the second child is of often um, problematic. The second curve that you're seeing here in blue is natural menopause, and that's really the cessation or senescence of reproductive lifespan. And reproductive lifespan really stops at around 50, 51. Um, and that means that of the girls that are currently born here in Denmark and many other places, we're expecting them to live to 100 now, 50% of them at least. And that means that they'll be living half their lifespan now without their sex steroids, such as est estrogens. So, we're really very interested in the lab to try and understand what shapes these curves and also, of course, what are the sequelae in, in this case? What happens to them as, as they age, depending on when they lose their fertility or when they have natural menopause? So I'm going to start with ovarian aging and, and the onset of, of menopause in terms of, of how the biology and female biology is very, very different from male biology with respect to reproduction. So doing field development, about 7 million oocytes are set aside of being generated. By birth, there are about 2 million left. Then as girls hit men or puberty, there are about 300 to 400,000. Um, and then it depletes further until menopause. So at birth, this is what we consider the ovarian reserve. Now, throughout this development and reproductive lifespan as well, these oocytes, they, they are trees. They die at a very, very high rate. So of the 7 million that a female fetus will have, only about 400 actually make it to ovulation, um, as you can see down, down here. Um, furthermore, the reproductive hormones that we rely on and we know is very, very important for health, such as estrogens, only really start to be produced around menarche when these follicles here start growing and the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis starts kicking in. So at menopause, a number of things happen, of course, and we also know that for menopause, that afterwards, there are a number of sequelae that, that occur, such as elevated risk of osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease as well. Um, and one of the big interventions that's been very successful has been synthetic estrogens or hormone replacement therapies. And they do protect against a number of things um, as women undergo menopause. So what do we know about the setting that age and natural menopause? All women go through this, so this is a common trait. It's a quantitative trait as well because it depends when you're going through it. And this is a trait as well that's probably best studied because it's common by genome-wide association studies because there we look at common variants. Um, there's been a number of these studies, uh, some of them also conducted by ourselves, and we now know of about 54 genetic variants. This might not seem a lot, but together with another 124 rare monogenic genes, so these are mutations that we see in families sometimes, but only really affects one or two women worldwide. These, are, um, these um, mutations, they're high penetrance, and they cause something called um, primary ovarian insufficiency. So together we have about 170 odd different genes that we know are involved in determining when the ovarian reserve is basically gone and when reproductive senescence occurs. So 
We know from those genes and when they act, when they express as well, that the genetic regulation occurs throughout the reproductive lifespan. So from basically all sites being formed, how many are established, and then of course the depletion rate throughout um, the lifespan of the woman. One of the things, of course, that's very interesting then is that if these are common variants that determine when natural menopause is going to happen and when the reproductive senescence will occur in a woman, we would kind of think that if these genes um, have conserved function, they might also be important for other traits and potentially also other diseases in, in humans. So we conducted a study together with John Perry at the MRC Epidemiology Unit in Cambridge in the UK, and we looked at the UK biobank data for loss of the Y chromosome in men. So as men age, we know that, that an increasing proportion, up to about 50% when men reach 70 years, that they have lost their Y chromosome in some, in some of their blood cells. This is the most common and I think best studied somatic mutation that happens in the human genome. This losing the Y chromosome in men. Now, the mosaic loss of, of the Y chromosome or the somatic loss of Y chromosome in blood cells has been observationally also associated with a number of diseases, elevated risk of certain cancers, type 2 diabetes, and also Alzheimer's and heart disease. And when we overlay um, the networks that we are finding and the genes that are driving age at natural menopause, we find that this is a shared genetic network that also affects the loss of Y. And the reason for that is because the molecular mechanisms, we think, that maintain the health of X or all sites in the ovary are DNA repair genes and also cell cycle genes. And these are also important for maintaining the Y chromosome, which is really small in blood cells. Can we use this for anything? Can we, if this genetic network is shared, we should also see predispositions to, to cancers that can now be explained in the population of men that, that perhaps have an elevated risk of, of uh, LOI and also in women with an elevated risk of an early onset of natural menopause. So we can start forming these genetic risk scores now that are associated with non-hematological cancers. So this means cancers outside of the, of the blood system. And in men, you can see prostate cancer and testicular germs and calcers are coming. In women, breast cancers and also ovarian and endometrial cancers to some extent. We're seeing that if you basically have, you have an elevated uh, odds ratio per unit of mosaic loss of Y or the genes in women. So where are we with these studies at the moment? Well, we know that a common genetic variants in the population now are influencing aging phenotypes that are shared in different diseases, and it's determined really by their molecular functions. So we're seeing them in the reproduction in women. This is menopause, when, when oocytes have lost, um, have lost, I guess, their, their protection, their DNA protection, and have been depleted, but also in cancers. Uh, these... Um, Genetic variants, of course, at the moment, when we look at the, at the ROC curves at the moment, are not great. And I think one of the things that we need to do is really expand the GWASH network to much larger studies um, than we currently have. And we think that this, if we can understand when specific genetic variants act and how they act, we might actually be able to look at interventions for women, particularly those at risk of very early menopause. Because if you have a, very, uh, uh, if you have a high risk of that, we might go in and try and see if we can stop or certainly alleviate um, depletion of the ore sites. The other curve that we're interested in is fertility. This is the first curve that really, uh, I think, affects uh, females. And this fertility curve is obviously something that, that is very interesting because we're seeing falling fertility rates across the world. It's, it's, it's a basically, um, usually we, we talk about replacement being 2.1 children per woman. We're now down to 0.9 in South Korea. In Denmark, it's 1.7. So we are way below um, replacement. And this creates also socioeconomic issues with an aging population. So what is it about the fertility curve that shapes it and can we try and understand how it attains this shape? 
So in order to do this, we started looking at many different organisms, and the shape of the human, which is kind of an inverted U-curve, is really very different from most other biological species that we know. So in most species, um, individuals will reproduce until they die. So reproductive lifespan and also fertility is usually linked to lifespan. This is what you see in chimps, for example, here in the blue line, that everything is kind of flat with female age. Um, in, across the population. So what might give human its unique fertility shape, the, the curve? So there are a couple of hypotheses out there, so that in the very young and teenagers, we know that there's elevated risk of obstetric complications, and also that, generally speaking, very young teenagers, say 13, etc., they have very high risk of, of, um, of complications also during pregnancy. This is thought to be because of the evolution of bipedal motion um, and linked to that the hip development occurs after the HPO axis is switched on at Menarche um, and then the hips they continue to develop and expand up to the mid at least the, the late 20s. At the other side the deceleration and, and the, the, the fast decline in fertility rates as women go in from their mid 30s and upwards has been suggested to be because of social or cultural evolution, but linked to, um, linked to a, a fitness in terms of grandchildren, meaning that women stop having their own children and instead put their effort and energy into raising their grandchildren. So this means that women who are able to do that would have more grandchildren compared to women who don't do that. That's the hypothesis. So we have all of these hypotheses uh, from evolution and also from what we know, clinical phenotypes. And we were really interested in whether we could try to understand what is the molecular, if, if this is really true, what is the molecular um, system that underlies this fertility curve? Because there should be one that evolution acts on, or selection acts on. So we have access to the human germline and early embryos now, and we hypothesized because we know that as women increase in age, the incidence of Down syndrome increases, we know that the eggs go bad. And we know that this kind of division here, often when the egg ovulates, is defective, and that the chromosomes end up in the wrong places. So we hypothesized that perhaps these errors in chromosomes in the egg shape the entire fertility curve. So we've developed um, single cell and low input sequencing where we take these eggs and we can then whole genome amplify them. We have AI algorithms that we can then use in order to map everything in theory from, from variants of single nucleotide variants up to whole chromosome gain and losses. And we have a very high incidence of, of various different genomic disorders that we're looking at. But in this case, we're focusing on whole chromosome errors because we know that they affect pregnancies at a very high rate in humans. So we started an egg collection program here in Denmark, and we've collected uh, eggs both from ovaries and also IVF clinics. Our argument or reasoning was really that if we have a system here that's affecting um, something as evolutionary stable as our fertility curves, then it shouldn't matter where we sample from, and we, it shouldn't matter who you're sampling from and how you treat the eggs per se. This must be some kind of intrinsic system that's inbuilt. So the way that we do it from ovaries, for example, is um, this is an ovary from an eight-year-old, and you can see here that these primordial follicles are lying, um, arresting. This is the ovarian reserve, and this is what has to be protected if you treat girls or women with chemotherapy, for example. We basically shave that down to the cortex, about a millimeter, so we can freeze them without too much tissue damage, and then we can auto-transplant again once the woman would like children. During that process, we release all of the eggs from the ovary that are growing and these follicles um, that are not being used and can't be frozen either. And we use them for research under informed consent. So we use our single cell uh, methods then to go in and take a biopsy of both the first polar body and also the, the egg. So this is the egg that's ready to fertilize. And we basically ask, do they have one chromosome each as they should do? Um, and you can see here that some of them gain, some of them, um, some of the chromosomes when they're gained or lost during this division, we can really, really nicely pick them up. This is chromosome one, for example. So using all of this material that we have in our single cell methods, we can then answer the question, what happens to errors in this division here when everything should be perfect, ready for the sperm to come in and start a new life? Um, and this is what we see. So when we look at good X or euploid X, you can see that the curve here basically is a nice overlay 
it's higher though, than the fertility curve. And that means that chromosome errors in human eggs seem to shape the curve that we have with regards to fertility. Interestingly as well, the chromosomes that are affected are different. So in the very young, in the teenagers, it's large chromosomes. These are chromosomes one to six. They're the biggest chromosomes that we have. Um, we never really see them in live birth, and we never see them really in, even in fetal losses. On the other side, as women age, they go into um, advanced maternal age, and this is where we see a lot of the problems in society. Uh, it's the acrocentric chromosomes that are making mistakes, such as 15 and 21 and 22. And 21 is the one that predisposes to, to Down syndrome if trisomic. So what would be the molecular mechanism for this? Because that's really what we want to get at if we have to try and understand interventions and try and see if we can actually use interventions other than just screening programs. So we have, through a lot of data, we have come up with, um, this, with this model here that chromosomes age. So as we inherit the chromosomes in oocytes from the fetus, uh, the homologous chromosomes here have recombined. So they have crossed over and they've also uh, established this molecular glue here that holds them together. Over time, as the eggs uh, or the oocytes are lying there resting in the ovary and waiting to be ovulated decades later, potentially, this glue is lost over time at some rate that we don't know, but this is what we are seeing. Now, for large chromosomes, as you can see, it's not so problematic. There are lots of crossover sites that are holding them together as a physical tether. There's quite a bit of molecular glue. They're doing okay as women go into their third or fourth decade. Um, however, if you're an acrocentric small chromosome, a fifth of the size, there is less crossovers. We know that. There's also less molecular glue, and this predisposes, for example, the centromeres to come apart too early, and they may segregate into, um, into a mitotic-like division, and you can see there's now three, not two, uh, chromatids in this egg. Um, and there's even worse loss of this molecular glue or cohesion um, for whole chromosome arms losing them and then the chromosomes behaving as if they were never attached to each other when they ovulate, ending in something we call reverse segregation. And that's something that we see with maternal age, advanced maternal age. So these models here really help us now try to understand what's happening at the chromosomal level to fertility. What about the very young girls, though? Why, why would chromosomes one and six that are absolutely, we think, fine as women age, why would they cause such problem in teenagers? So this is highly speculative, but um, we think that perhaps there might be cohesin or molecular glue overloading. Um, and this is, this is just speculation. So we think that perhaps there's a lot of molecular glue laid down because these eggs have to sit there for a long time. But in the young girls, there might be too much that's holding them together as the chromosomes try to divide. And then we, what we see is that chromosomes can't come apart. And they make what we call myos, classical meiosis one non disjunction, which is what we see. So the large chromosomes are vulnerable if there's a lot of glue or if there's a lot of connection points by recombination that can't be undone in these younger eggs. Small chromosomes would be fine at this stage because there's not so much molecular glue. So they would be able to remove it all prior to dividing, and you would get a normal division. So this would give us, if correct, this is something, first of all, that we can test, and two, it's also something that would give us a molecular system that allows a molecular clock to tick with regards to fertility. So I'm just going to summarize here that human eggs are error prone. I've shown you that. At an average, it's 30 percent, but as women go into their 40s, we're talking about 85 percent. The chromosome based system shapes fertility curves and can explain it. We see stochastic processes such as the removal or the loss of the molecular glue or cohesion, and also the inbuilt vulnerabilities, whether you're a large or small chromosome. And the implication, of course, is that we have programmed infertility and subfertility. And if this is the case, really, we should also have some sort of genetic regulation because this should be heritable across generations and populations. And we've started doing that now because it's a common trait with GWASH, and we have confirmed, certainly, with the limitation that it's a targeted GWASH, that common variants in cohesion, um, the molecular glue, as well as recombination genes, they predispose to um, or is associated with an elevated risk of Down syndrome. 
So if I have a couple of minutes, I can, one minute, I can just very briefly say, can we use this knowledge for anything specific with respect to interventions? And the idea is, of course, that we think we can. If we can understand the, the rate of loss of cohesion, for example, we should be able to design interventions. But is there also something much more immediate that we could do and use our knowledge for? So we started our collaboration with Henriette Svar a few years back. She's the director of our National Recurrent Pregnancy Loss Unit in Denmark. And recurrent pregnancy loss is basically three or more losses. They usually happen within the first trimester, but don't have to. Um, and then you, you, you get a referral to, to the unit. The three losses can occur either primary, meaning that you haven't had any babies yet, or it could also be secondary, meaning you have had children, or the woman has had children. And one of the things that Henriette did together with David Westergaard and Søren Brunach is started is leveraging the Danish registers to try and ask, not what happens before, but actually what happens after these women have had some very, very severe um, losses. So there's an early component, both for primary and secondary, and there's also a late component that's happening 10 years later. And I think 10 years later is not old. We're not talking about 70-year-old women here. We're talking about women who are 45, 50, um, that, that are experiencing elevated um, risks or associations with certain diseases and disorders. Um, so the first one that's coming early is pregnancy and coagulation and also chromosome errors. So for example, that you're a balanced chromosome carrier, translocation carrier, this is quite expected. But what's perhaps unexpected is that we see a whole range of other disorders coming up as well in these women. This, this is about up to 3% of women in our population. So there's some specific parts as well to whether you've had a baby or not. And then, of course, there's also common phenotypes as well, the disorders that come later on, um, including, for example, type 2 diabetes. So we wanted to try and understand this, obviously. Um, and one thing that we kind of thought about was, well, we don't actually know what woman, who is who here. And, and that's really, really problematic because we don't investigate the fetal losses. And we know that when we look at fetal losses, particularly the early losses in the first trimester, about 50% at least, they have a chromosome error, meaning they are trisomic for Down syndrome, for Patel, Edwards. And that's why we have public health screening programs across the world for this. So what we decided to do with Henrietta was try and see, if, well, you know, the, the, the vision would be that if we know women who have lost once or might be at risk at loss, we can send them in the right direction for clinical interventions. So women who would be at risk or who have repeated aneuploid losses, they could also be due to male factors because the semen quality is, is poor. We could send them to IVF clinics now. And in IVF clinics, we now have um, screening programs of embryos before we transfer. So we could then pick uh, embryos that are euploid and prevent the transmission or transfer of aneuploid chromosomes or, or embryos that have damaged chromosomes. On the other hand, of course, there are the women we think will come in with immunological factors and the endocrinological factors and a whole range of other factors who wouldn't be helped by, by, by this treatment. Um, and for those, of course, we would look at whether we could use other interventions as well. This would hopefully also maybe tell us something about comorbidities, whether the comorbidities appear because a woman has been through three losses or more, or whether because, or whether because there might be common genetic networks that predispose to both. In, in either case, we think that the, the ultimate aim would be to increase life birth rates and reduce recurrent pregnancy losses and potentially also allow us early interventions of these comorbidities that we see. So I'm just going to show you what we've done as, um, to start stratifying. We need to get the pregnancy losses and we need to get all of them and we need particularly to get the very early losses. And this is really what we started doing as a worst case scenario. Uh, so this is, a, this is a, from a woman who has lost at home the, the fetus, the fetal loss has been in, in, in the fridge for a few days, Co comes to, to, the, to Henriette, we pick it up and, and then we look at, and this is the kind of tissue we're dealing with. 
But rather than try to grow cells from this or try to do anything fancy with it, what we do is we just basically prick it and we use our low input DNA sequencing um, so that we can basically get a diagnosis from the fetus and we can rule out this is not maternal by genotyping. And, um, and we can basically get a fetal diagnosis whether this was a euploid loss and likely a loss because of immunological factors or whether there was an aneuploid loss because there was an extra chromosome. So we did a proof of concept that this might actually lead to something. Um, and this was a couple who had had a very severe, um, a severe um, trajectory. So the first loss were twin boys um, in week 22. And then there were another six losses, so eight losses in total. Um, and they came earlier and earlier and earlier. And the big question that Henrietta had was, of course, whether we sent this couple to IVF treatment and tried to test the embryos, or whether we try an immunological intervention on the woman. So we did loss 9 and 10 using our pipeline here, and it was euploid male. So we knew that this woman was not one of the women who had repeated losses because she had bad eggs, but instead probably because there was some kind of immunological factor. And we know that with boy fetuses, or male fetuses in particular, that this can be problematic because of the HY antigens. So a few weeks ago, we got the very good news that the immunological intervention she was on for Colimus, that she's been on low base, this is also used for organ transplant, um, that she actually had a live birth baby. So we were very, very pleased. Uh, so this was our proof of concept, really, that we can learn something from it and we can start stratifying a very complex, um, I think, disorder. What can we use all of this for? Well, it might mean that reproductive phenotypes can act as early markers for later disease, and that by understanding these very early trajectories that women are on, basically, that we could learn what might, they might be predisposed to later, and that would really get us towards uh, personalized medicine. We really wish as well, of course, to, to look at whether we can elucidate further genetic regulation and the molecular mechanisms as well, so we can get a much better understanding of where drug interventions or other interventions might be feasible. Um, and I think that if we can understand, for example, recurrent pregnancy loss, we might have opportunities both for primary, the primary condition, but also, of course, preventing or reducing the burden of the comorbidities that we see in relatively young women in their 50s. So with that, I just want to thank all the girls and women who participated. We get 100% informed consent rate here in Denmark. It's a very, very fantastic um, um, study and place to be with respect to uh, participation. All our funders, um, the many clinics that we work with, and of course, um, the people in the lab who have done a lot of this work. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Just stay here. Um, we will take some questions. Maybe we can stop if there's any questions in the audience. Otherwise, I know that there are some questions posted on Slack. Um, so I have posted a few questions. We can maybe take one of mine, if that's OK. Um, so uh, there are probably different etiologies uh, in POI, but could POI be characterized? Is it at the could some of them be characterized as having developmental defects, or could you consider them as an accelerated ovarian aging? Yeah, this is a really great question. Um, I think the PUI genes that we know of, some of them are syndromic, so galactosemia, for example. So they're basically, they're, the girls are infertile from, from pretty much when they start seeing them clinically, you mm -hmm. know, menarch or earlier. Right. Um, then there are others like FANGM, Fanconi anemia M mutations, where we know that the, the women are not predisposed to Fanconi anemia, but they are predisposed to having very early menopause. Uh -huh. So it seems that Fanconi anemia is very important, perhaps, in establishing the, um, the ovarian reserve <laughs> by, um, by mitotic divisions and repairing chromosomes and DNA during establishment of seven, or making seven million eggs, right. but potentially also in the depletion. Yeah. So I think there are different etiologies, and as, as we know more about the genetic networks, we can also be much more exact in what a specific person's or woman's uh, predispositions would be. All right, very cool. Uh, any questions from the audience? We have one from Mansour. I'm going to hold this because of corona. <laughs> During development, cells, embryonic cells undergo massive epigenetic DNA modifications. Mm -hmm. Is there any link between disturbances in genetic modification in egg cells and 
error proneness of the egg cells and penetrance of these low side they should late, later age uh, uh, disease proneness? This is a really, really great question. Um, we don't think there's any, um, there's any correlation with epigenetic modifications and aneuploidies later on in error proneness in that way. The major, the major developmental stage where we know there is, is doing early embryogenesis in pre-implantation embryos, where a remodeling um, of the chromatin is a major factor and risk factor to generating not, not um, aneuploidies, but chromosome rearrangements that would give rise to mosaic de novo copy number variants. So I think that, uh, and also I should say embryonic arrest. So 50% of human embryos, they fail to progress past the first initial two and three divisions after fertilization. And we think that chromatin remodeling and getting the genome going is, is a major, um, the embryo's own genome going is a major restriction there at that stage. But we don't think that it's a factor for later predisposition to aneuploidies. So we have uh, maybe the last question here from, uh, this is on Slack, from Dr. Jenny Sandquist. She asks, what role, if any, does NK cells play in RPL? Yeah, we would really like to know that. We think they play a massive role, um, but um, unfortunately, fetuses would be infiltrated with NK cells, which we would expect, and um, or the placenta interface, um, and I think that's something that we would have to look at and study. It, generally speaking, human fetal losses are just not, um, are not studied if they occur in the first trimester. So it's, it's, it's really an open area. Okay. But, but there are definitely intervention opportunities with, with um, in, NK infiltration, yeah. Mm. Maybe one more question, because it's been upvoted and it's, it's, a, it's my own question. So uh, um, I ask, in other species, fertility curves are very different. So in reptiles, fertility rates increase over time. <clears throat> Is there a fundamental difference in germline maintenance across species? Yes, there is. Um, some species, they propagate throughout, you know, some species like some fish, crown fish, you know, um, they, or separate fish, they change sex, you know. So um, I think, I think there's, there's, <laughs> there's vast differences. In mammals, um, the vast majority of mammals, there's one exception, mm -hmm. but with, in mammals, you're born, the females are born with an ovarian reserve and that's set aside <laughs> and then they deplete over time. Right. But, but other organisms, they have vastly different reproductive strategies. Mm. Very interesting. Well, thank you very much. Let's give Eva another round of applause.